everyone. Uh, up next is our presenter, Eleanor, and she's going to be speaking about the future of sex. Hi. How my levels? So uh, why am I up here talking about sex? Um, sex is pretty fundamental to society. Sex and relationships are one of the fundamental forces that shape the structure of society. If you change how somebody eats, you may change their routine. You may have some larger economic effects. If you change how someone sleeps with people or who they sleep with, you've changed almost everything in their life in a long-term kind of way. In general, design and design objects and experiences and systems have a huge effect on every aspect of our lives in ways we don't even necessarily realize. Sex and relationships are definitely included in this category. Social desires feed technological change. They fund, they prioritize, they permit research and development that goes on in the course of you know, technological development. But the objects and the concepts that come out of those technological changes feed back into society and change society as well. So can we subvert the desires of the larger society by looking at the technological objects that we create? Social change requires mass disruption. Um, individual hacking can at best sort of prefigure and rehearse what those larger social changes will be. But if we want to have some kind of actual mass effect, you need mass adoption, you need mass social change. Social, um, technological change is kind of weird. In the, the technological change in five years doesn't necessarily register that much on a day-to-day -day kind of level, but compounded over 20 years, that same you know, steady pace of technological change can totally alter your life in a kind of an unrecognizable way. Knowing what may be coming later can be very, very useful in terms of helping us understand the current context of our lives. Um, the fictional future can teach us what's actually transgressive about the actual present that we're living in now. It's gonna get pretty weird. For the rest of the talk, I'm gonna explore this territory using design fictions as a lens. Specifically, we're gonna explore the, set, the following set of questions divided roughly into five categories. Intimacy, identity, awareness, control, and economics. I'm not gonna read these off. These are the motivating questions that help generate the rest of these fictions. And if you want to see these more detail, the slides will be online later. So we're going to be looking at things which are sort of right around the line of what's possible and what's understood. In general, everything that I'm talking about tonight are things that we know will be possible. We don't necessarily know, they're not necessarily things we can do right now, but we understand enough about the technologies involved to be able to usefully think about them from a design perspective. Um, out in the far future where we don't, you know, you can sort of make up, oh yeah, anything will be possible, but there's this sort of narrow window between what we can do right now, and some of the fictions are things that are realizable immediately, versus what we can do kind of at the limit of what we can see, and that's sort of where design becomes interesting. One other note, I'm specifically avoiding um, kind of genetic engineering and that sort of things that might be possible to change our bodies more directly. Um, in a lot of ways, that's territory that we don't understand well enough to know even what the relatively near future is gonna hold. And also this is focusing on a more kind of hard technological approach to the set of problems. There's a timeline on each of the slides for the fictions which will kind of help us navigate how far out we might be looking. Also, a lot of the fictions that I'm talking about here tonight don't necessarily just address sex directly. They're also looking at relationships, the ways we interact with people in a slightly broader context. Um, sex is necessarily political and heavily embedded in that kind of lived context of life. So we're gonna address this slightly more complicated territory. Some of the fictions that I'm talking about here are intended as very positive things that could be really cool. Some of them, maybe not so much. Um, the world is gonna change whether or not we want it to, so it's best to kind of have an idea of what ways the world might change so that we can prepare for it. On to the fictions. So the kind of fractured sexual identities of modern life 
really complicate meeting people who live near you, meeting people in a sort of um, geographically situated manner. Things like flagging in the BDSM scene don't really scale out into larger subtexts. And personal sites are great, but they're always opt-in. They, they actually kind of add another layer of division if you think about, oh, I'd like to meet somebody who I happen to be meeting on the street, that kind of thing. The people who you're interacting with probably aren't signed up to whatever personal site you're signed up to. The mechanisms of subculture can be kind of effective at meeting people, like, oh, the people that you see in a club across town, whatever, that kind of thing. But that's actually kind of another form of division. The default assumption when you have these sort of complicated sexual identities is that, oh, somebody who I meet isn't necessarily somebody who's going to be interested in me. There isn't that default assumption of commonality to the same degree anymore. So, I mean, subcultures and sexual diversity can actually alienate us from our surroundings because of that. So, if you believe that privacy is dead, why wait for people to announce that they're looking? You walk into a grocery store and your phone kind of takes a look around and figures out who all the other phones that it can see belong to, um, and then drift nets through their data shadows. Um, oops. So, you know, you see somebody, oh, over, over checking, by the, checking out the fruit, and your phone lets you know, oh, yeah, you know, they're actually really compatible. She likes getting choked. You should go talk to her. So you do. <laughs> the, techn um, the, the mobile um, technological parts of this are actually pretty simple. Um, a bit more locative space awareness from phones, a um, little bit more promiscuous identities on, on the part of phones, and honestly, with the way... Um, Mobile vulnerabilities are going. It doesn't take that much to be able to get this kind of information out of a phone. The um, filtering of the, the kind of data footprints, the data shadows that people leave online is the interesting part. Um, you've got kind of semantic web style analysis. You've got all the social network enumeration, um, heuristic analysis of past interactions, like, you know, oh, well, if you liked sleeping with Sue, you'll love Mary. <laughs> um, and also kind of looking really carefully at all of the increasingly large amounts of relevant information that people are putting out online. So there's an argument, of course, that there's a standard of public propriety that keeps us from thinking about sex in these sort of very public contexts. But should there be? I mean, is there actually a reason that we have that kind of divide? On the other hand, there's some really complicated implications for a system like this, in, which can be pretty scary in the real world, um, you know, sexualizing public space when you have um, rape and stalking and this sort of just rampant misogyny, you know, there's, there's a bit of questionability there. So fashion and body language are both ubiquitous and really versatile, but they have limits in terms of how much they can surface identity. Um, they also feed things that you don't always want to feed. You want to show the world that you've kind of opted out of this whole consumptive cycle and, and all that? Well, yeah, there's a product line for that. So they're also very limited. Um, modern identities and, and who we are are very complicated. There's a limit to how much you can show other people about who you are with items that also have to be functional. That, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of limits there. And there are a lot of details of modern identity that are really hard to read given the language that you have available. I mean, the whole concept of femme dyke invisibility, you know, there's only so much that those kinds of things can show off. Turning our bodies into physical billboards doesn't go that far. So why bother trying to make a complex identity fit into this very commoditized physical world? Splash it around your virtual presence. Um, instead, and not just you know, your virtual presence on your homepage or anything like that. Um, replace the image that people see with a mutable full body avatar. Show the world an entirely different identity without all the complications of physical objects. Don't want to push things that far? Just show up a, a simple set of icons that kind of hover over you when people look at you that, you know, give people a bit of an, a better idea that show off different facets of your identity in your data stream. For anybody who hasn't been watching it explode over the past few years, there's this concept of augmented reality. Um, basically, you have something which is shooting video, you know, like, say, a phone, and overlaid onto that video stream are various pieces of data or 3D renderings or all sorts of things. Um, the phone knows what it's looking at, and software inserts those um, different images into the video stream based on positional data that the phone can figure out. 
AR has been exploding for a lot of reasons, and it seems like it's going to keep taking off and possibly become a fairly important component of how we interact with the world. Currently, um, existing systems are pretty limited in terms of what they can actually do. They're good at overlaying building-sized chunks of graphics at kind of map scale um, distances. They're not so good at overlaying finer data onto things like actual people, but that's coming. That's just a matter of engineering. It will happen. Um, in order to be socially interesting, though, this kind of stuff has to get more ubiquitous, and that's one of the reasons why this is kind of a bit further out. You know, there's no point in projecting this identity if nobody's looking at it. It's probably going to happen, though, um, and there's some other interesting things that come up from that. Right now, if you want to use a lot of the common mobile AR stuff that's actually being deployed at a consumer level, you have to have an iPhone. If you, can't have an, if you can't afford an iPhone, you're locked out from that entire set of media. What happens when that becomes more socially relevant? What happens when, if you have money, it's simply assumed that you're going to have this sort of media cloud around you and that you'll be able to see everyone else's, and you're literally locked out from half the social identity that people are presenting. Um, that's kind of an interesting situation and one that we're already starting to see hints of. So advertising is a big part of what drives sexual desire and what drives the cultural formation of sexual desire. And a lot of the things that advertising does to us as far as sexual desire go aren't necessarily that great. Um, it is responsible for a lot of the very, very problematic body image issues, all sorts of things along those lines, or at least strongly contributes to them. So a few years ago, Sao Paulo banned all outdoor advertising, which I think is awesome. You know, no more staring at ugly billboards, all of that kind of stuff. Why wait for that to spread? It would take a fairly intrusive AR system, but why not have ad block for the real world? You just don't see advertisements anymore. You know, they're replaced with whatever sort of graphics you'd like. You know, how does that change in the long term how you think about sex, how you think about body image? if you don't have this kind of constant assault of these hyper-perfect heteronormative bodies. On the other hand, what happens when spammers get in there and you can't see anything else? So the sexual revolution at the end of the modern period in the 60s and 70s was brought about by a lot of different things, enabled by a lot of different things. One of the big things there, though, was the pill. It made sex safe, it made sex less serious, it helped divorce sex from reproduction. In the 80s and the 90s, AIDS and at least the sort of larger growing awareness of the rape culture have kind of undone some of that. They've ushered in what you might sort of call late heteronormativity. What if you could make sex less serious again? What if you could turn back the clock? So you're out drinking at a bar and there's a woman who you have definite chemistry with, you've just met, and you'd kind of like to sleep together, but you both forgot gloves. So you both get out your phones, and yeah, you exchange numbers and stuff, but you're also trading a limited medical authorization. You press your phone up against her abdomen and tap a button to wake up her implant and send a status query, and the report back comes back green on all the STI, um, STI tracking data, and your phone confirms the device signature. She checks you out and, well, head out for the door. Implantable, implantable medical devices are advancing by leaps and bounds. Currently, most implants are special purpose devices focusing primarily on various kinds of therapeutic electrical stimulation, but this is changing really rapidly. Many devices are already capable of sensing a broad range of physiological parameters, and manufacturers have been working for a while on drug dispensing implants, implants which are being produced or intended for purely diagnostic purposes are starting to show up but manufacturers are moving pretty slowly. They're fairly conservative, and there's issues about whether implanting something, which is currently a fairly risky operation, is going to be the best diagnostic process. But that's changing. In the research world, um, work is being done on communicating networks of implants. Um, you might have an implant looking at impedance-based measurements of lung fluid, another dispensing an emergency bronchial dilator when you need it, and a third one archiving the information and periodically talking to an external device via radio to let your doctor know what's going on. So the challenges here are pretty non-trivial. Um, 
Power management is a huge concern as the devices have to run on batteries that last five to eight years. Some of the newer devices are using inductive charging, which might be an option. Or for very low power devices, you could also have something running on biofuel cells that take energy directly from the body parasitically. The security and privacy concerns for inter-implant and implant external communication are very non-trivial, especially as a lot of implants can't afford the CPU to do modern cryptography, and they don't have a lot of storage space. But Moore's Law has a way of making these kind of concerns go away over time. Advances in microfluidics, which is a technology where minute amounts of fluids are moved through channels cut out of silicon wafers at a uh, chip scale, are allowing the rapid miniaturization of diagnostics labs, so things which currently take a large laboratory are being able to done, be able to be done now in fairly small devices, which are, you know, currently maybe like paperback book size, but are approaching something that could eventually be implantable. Disease detection is a really significant research priority for this kind of work because if you have these small, cheap, easily reproducible devices that can detect diseases, it lets you operate in the field, it lets you operate in the third world, it really increases your scope there. And eventually, it's, you know, the, as these things follow the same kind of capability and cost and size trajectory as other semiconductor devices, it's likely that this kind of stuff will start to make sense as a diagnostic device from a risk-benefit perspective. So there's a lot of other scenarios here. So even if you, you know, so you have this device, why not enable it for personal, you know, for other more personal uses too? But so what happens if somebody reprograms their implant so that uh, it'll lie about their HIV plus status and you're exposed? There's probably a crime that's been committed there, but what's the crime? Is the crime exposing you to the HIV or is the crime reprogramming the implant to lie about it? There are other things which could be interesting there. Um, an implant could tell you when you're getting dangerously intoxicated or it could detect GHB in your bloodstream. This might be really useful for you know, not getting too wasted when you don't want to, but on the other hand, it could cut both ways. So if you're a victim of date rape, can the rapist subpoena the data from your implant to prove that you weren't so intoxicated that you couldn't actually consent? Is that implant part of you? Can it be forced to testify against you? You know, does it have for the, in the US Fifth Amendment rights? Or is it just another external device despite its kind of very privileged position inside your body? So in some stereotypically masculine worldviews, orgasms define sex. If you came, you had sex. This of course obviously ignores the fact that many women are either pre-orgasmic or will frequently not have an orgasm during many sex acts that they participate in, sometimes even ones they enjoy. On top of this, there are all sorts of fetishes specifically about the act of having an orgasm, chief among them various forms of orgasm denial. But what if you could control this at the push of a button? So orgasms are part of the same part of the nervous system that controls breathing and heartbeat, et cetera. There's a point on the sacral nerve in the, in the middle of the lower back which can be used to trigger orgasms through electrical stimulation. In addition to triggering them, with careful measurement, you can detect an orgasm. And because that's being transmitted partially by electrical pulses, if you apply an inverse electrical pulse, which is carefully timed, you can also prevent them from happening. Um, so, there's a whole bunch of implanted electrical devices that do exactly this kind of electrostimulation. And there's actually a series of clinical trials being run by a doctor in North Carolina on exactly this. Um, they're not considered a necessary medical device, so you have to pay up front, but this kind of work is actually literally already happening. Sensing is a bit more difficult, but it's entirely within the range of what we can do now. And reliable suppression might be difficult, but it's basically an engineering problem. You know, we understand how to do it. It's just a, a question of getting the engineering working. So from one perspective, you could call this sort of the ultimate sex toy. Uh, push a button, have an orgasm. Dial knobs for intensity and duration, you know. Decoupling orgasms from their normal context is kind of interesting, too. Um, how does having an orgasm which doesn't involve any kind of sexual stimulation change that experience? As a DS device, what happens when you set up a remote control for your orgasms permanently, you know, and permanently give that button to somebody else? 
um, with an implant set up so that you can't have an orgasm without it. On the other hand, what about a monitoring only device? Um, how would that work and to change state treatment of sex offenders? What happens when you require a sex offender to account for the timing and location of every orgasm they have? Well, obviously the roots of sex offense are very complicated. Does having a push button orgasm allow them to reintegrate into society and resist offending again? Other people might be interested in a monitoring device too. It could be the ultimate purity ring, verifiable evidence that the person you're sleeping with never had an orgasm regardless of whether or not they've tried. And with push button control, no more having to learn about how to please somebody. What would a device like this do to sex work? Um, would people with implants still patronize sex workers, assuming they were otherwise inclined to? Um, how would it change that interaction? Would sex work become more about human touch and less about getting off? Would sex workers use the implants? So sex work occupies a kind of conflicted political space in the modern left. It's fairly safe to state, though, that in most current legal regimes, the majority of sex workers engaging in heteronormative sex acts are at a significant power disadvantage compared to their clients. In order for a sex worker to operate, their clients have to be able to find them in at least some sort of context, whether that's on the street or you know, in calls or whatever. The clients can frequently be relatively anonymous outside of the actual moment of the physical transaction. The sex worker who's already disadvantaged by this is often more legally vulnerable than the client who may only be socially vulnerable based on that, you know, in that legal system. So imagine that you're a sex worker and your most recent session went poorly and the client didn't pay. You're not normally in a position to ask for anything like identification that might give you any sort of recourse. You know, there's no way that the client is gonna give you that. However, your client can't avoid leaving DNA evidence behind. So you swab some material with a little paperback sized DNA sequencer. 10 minutes later, you anonymously upload the sequence and find a match in a public genetic database. The sequencer signs its sample with an anonymized but verifiable cryptographic signature. You add a note which describes the exact circumstances under which that sample of genetic material is taken. And you let Google do the rest of it. So <coughs> DNA sequencers are getting really fast and really cheap and that's not slowing down anytime soon. There are some questions these days about how strong DNA evidence really is, but tactically that may not actually matter. The social onus will probably still end up being on the other person whose DNA was posted online to explain what happened or why somebody wanted to frame them if that's what they're claiming. So people do a lot of really stupid stuff while they're drunk or they're high or otherwise not all that with it. Um, a lot of that stupid stuff tends to involve sex. Sometimes your friends step in, but they're not always around, and maybe your friends are the problem. <laughs> so how much can somebody be protected from themselves? Take a pair of glasses with a camera in them that stream video remotely, add a speakerphone, and an implant that measures blood alcohol. Before you decide to go out drinking, figure out what the limits that you'd like to set for yourself are. Later that night, you walk up to the bar to get another drink, and your glasses flash an icon at you, telling you, you have, that you've had enough, and the bartender notices it and you know, not, shakes his head at you. Elsewhere, later, you've ended up somewhere secluded with somebody you've been flirting with. A voice in your ear warns you that you're not really sober enough to decide whether or not you want to sleep, somebody, sleep with someone as per the limits that you set earlier. You ignore it. A little while longer and your phone trips over into speakerphone mode and tells the other person that you're not sober enough to consent and that per prior agreement you're not currently legally in charge of your actions and that this would therefore be rape. And you know, so they decide to go on their way. You end up safely at home without another embarrassing complication to deal with and with, mu with a much less painful morning than you might have had otherwise. Portable video streaming and micro displays are already pretty common. Um, combining them into a socially acceptable package is something that's a little bit more difficult. Um, the implant technology is a bit more complicated, but that's also something that's likely to come along sooner rather than later, especially for something that's fairly simple like that. The legal perspective for something like this becomes a lot more interesting. Is it possible for somebody to create a system in which by contract they temporarily give away 
the power of attorney to a call center employee who's acting on their prior instructions. While obviously the only meaningful solution to sexual assault is for people to stop assaulting other people, um, would something like this allow a useful, you know, fill a, a useful role in allowing people to go out and enjoy their evening and you know, still wake up happy the morning after? And what would it be like to be that call center employee? So long distance, relation, long distance relationships kind of suck. Um, keeping up the daily awareness and the feeling of connection going that you have when you have a local lover takes a lot of work. Um, technology has already radically changed how we interact with people in long distance relationships. Skype and IM and SMS and flat rate phone plans have made that kind of connection way, way, way easier. But where else can that go? The daily rhythm of life gets expressed in a lot of different ways. Um, some are big, some are small. Imagine sharing your heartbeat with a lover. You each have a bracelet that mirrors each other's, the, each other's heartbeat. You know, it's just like a little membrane tapping away on your wrist. Um, surprisingly, little things like that can carry a huge amount of information about somebody else's physiological state and about your partner's life. The technology behind this is pretty simple. This is something you can do today. Um, a GSM modem, a battery, a heart rate sensor, a little actuator. Um, obviously, at first, a bracelet like this would be pretty distracting, but sensations that keep going for long periods of time have a way of becoming integrated into our sensation, into our understanding. Given enough time, does this, would this kind of thing fall into that sort of sensory integration? Um, what does it end up meaning? Can you tell when somebody wakes up just from the rhythm of their heart? Um, can you tell what the rhythm of their day is? Um, how does it cross over into in-person interactions? There are some studies that have shown that even listening to loud music can actually apply a synchronizing effect to people's heartbeat over time, that your heart starts beating closer to the beat of the music. Would this end up doing that? Would you end up literally synchronizing heartbeats? What happens when you have multiple partners and you're receiving multiple different heartbeats? <laughs> so a heartbeat is a pretty simple measure of physiological state and a fairly coarse one, but what about the endocrine system? We're just still, we're still coming to understand just how heavily our mood and how our bodies perform and how we think and perceive are all things that are dependent on a fairly small number of chemicals. These are obviously really, really complex systems to be tampered with only very, very carefully. But as we understand them better, we may be able to both monitor and alter the balances of these neurotransmitters in real time, again, using implanted devices. While we currently act on the brain's chemical imbalance using drugs, these are really, really coarse, coarse mechanisms. They don't give us the kind of minute-to-minute -minute control. They don't give us the kind of um, behavioral control so that when some external environmental trigger happens, that manipulation could happen automatically. What would be the effect of directly inter interacting with your partner's endocrine system on a relationship? Imagine you have an endocrine mirror among, you know, I mean, carefully corrected to control for any sort of feedback effect, but designed to nudge you into sort of similar affective states over time. It could easily trigger like entirely new levels of codependency, <laughs> but it could also allow for radically more compatible interactions. You'd always sort of have a pretty intuitive understanding of where somebody was, even if you weren't in exactly the same state. Especially interesting would be, would be the effect on distance, you know, having that sort of constant feeling of how your lover was literally feeling, despite you know, knowing that you're separated by hundreds or thousands of miles. Even if the effects are isolated to a single partner um, and you're not doing this kind of joint feedback, situational-based alterations of neurochemistry could have really, a really interesting effect on relationships. Imagine an, Im an implant that gave you a steady drip of oxytocin every time you interact with your partner. You know, make that first month honeymoon last forever. Of course, if you're triggering neurochemical changes in response to outside behavior, you can also trigger them in response to all sorts of things. Similar to orgasms, you could give somebody a neurochemical remote control, sort of an emotional organ to play your brain. So virtual projections of identity are great and all, but what about the body itself? 
The category of ways that humans have altered themselves is large and pretty exhaustive, but the constant is that with the exception of things like makeup that are, you know, and hair that are really just sort of surface changes, and even hair, um, this sort of thing happens very, very slowly, you know, and, it, and it's not the kind of thing that you can reverse that easily. Um, what about projecting identities that are not just temporary, but situational, and doing so actually with your, your body more directly, um, having that kind of change that happens in very, very real time, but is actually embedded in the real world? There are plenty of reasons to do this, and not just acceptance by the monoculture. The kind of fragmented social spaces that we have today mean that you may want to be somebody very different in different situations as you go through your day. So you wake up in the morning, and you go about your usual routine. You pull on a t-shirt and jeans, and you head for the train. On the train, you get out your phone, and you dial your jeans and your color to the t-shirt that you sort to the, uh, you, dial, you dial, your, dial your jeans and your t-shirt to the color that you that feels right for the day, and you poke around online, you find a cute flash animation, you grab a frame from it, and you throw it on your t-shirt. And, uh, you know, it's nothing too flashy, it's just, you know, early morning. Um, you get to work, tattoos on your right arm sort of fade in slowly, it's a nice relaxing day. Your skin changes a little throughout the day, it sort of fades blank when you've got an old conservative client that you're talking to, blends something to a little bit darker and more aggressive as you're biking across town in the afternoon. In the evening at the club, your shirt is cycling through something vaguely biomechanical with gears and tentacles and stuff. And you see your ex walking across the room, and your, your skin flashes black in kind of shock, and you, you know, slip out the back. So products are already showing up on the market with flexible, low-resolution liquid crystal wraps that, you can, that can change color. Similar technologies are being used in experimental color-changing cloth that is literally <coughs> woven fabric that can change color. E-ink displays are getting cheaper and are starting to become more flexible. You know, they're starting to work on plastic substrates and that sort of thing. That's going to be showing up in clothing very, very soon. Um, you're already getting like the, the very flat LED panel type, you know, digitizer shirts. That's not that far from an actual display. So um, form may end up, you know, remaining a constraint for clothing because actually changing the shape of clothing is harder but color and design may actually become completely mutable, that you can just completely change what your wardrobe looks like. Um, we may be able to make implantable versions of these, disp of these displays too, but there are a lot of other options. Um, like I said, I'm mostly not talking about biotechnology here, but there are some really interesting things there if you look at the color-changing chromatophores on cephalopods that allow them to blend into the background instead of getting tattoos, get skin grafts. Um, the designs would be nominally under more mechanical control, but it would be really interesting if they ended up having a purely affective link as well, where they were actually just listening to your neurochemistry and acting in a roughly similar way to the way that, you know, your physical emotional responses happen. So that, you know, yeah, those, those patterns might be mostly under control, but not entirely. You know, we could end up engineering entirely new kinds of human emotional interactions, you know, building new types of body language. So profound alterations of the body are long-standing fantasies for a lot of people. They hold as much or more possibility of changing how we see each other than almost anything else we can do. And they also have some interesting implications on where we might li draw the lines on what human actually means, um, not to mention a lot of really hot sex. <laughs> Sadly, they're really unlikely to become within the reach of medical technology anytime soon. They're far, far, far more complicated than any of the kinds of invasive modifications I've talked about so far. Um, large-scale body modifications look to, become, look to remain extremely difficult for the foreseeable future, if not impossible. Biomechanical hybrid systems, though, where the modification is actually largely mechanical, are potentially a very, very different issue. So what would you give, would, would you give up an arm to have a prehensile tentacle in its place, one that could sense pressure and temperature? Um, you know, what if you lost an arm? Maybe. So there are a few emerging technologies which look really promising when looking at biomechanically fictionalized bodies. 
The first involves functional electrical stimulation, which is a specific kind of electrical stimulation of the nerves. FES uses an external or eventually even an implanted um, neuroprosthesis to stimulate nerves that have been injured. It's mostly used, obviously, for rehabilitative work currently. Current work has allowed paraplegic patients to stand and walk, um, restored hand grafts function to quadriplegics. In addition, however, the same technique is being used, still very experimentally, to provide sense input back into the human being from prosthetic limbs. Similar techniques are also used to sense the activations of motor nerves at amputation sites and then drive the motions of powered prosthetic limbs. Neuroplasticity is the function where the brain will reconstruct damaged portions and, damaged, and functions can literally migrate between different parts of the tissue of the brain. So that, you know, if um, a speech center gets damaged in a stroke, you may regain speech, but you won't be using the same part of your brain to speak anymore. It's implicated in all sorts of things. Um, stroke recovery, learning, um, chronic pain is literally a learned response where even when the stimulus goes away, your nerves are just used to sending pain signals, so they just keep doing so. Um, more importantly for us, it's also being used for modern prosthetics. Using a combination of implanted sensing electrode grids and FES-style driven electrode grids, a prosthetic can be attached to the ends of nerves at an amputation site. Initially, the nerves send and receive mostly noise, but over time, with sufficient training on the inputs and the outputs, a person can become attuned to the prosthetic and learn how to use that arm as though it will, and it will eventually feel like it's part of their body. One of the fascinating features of neuroplasticity is Although it's helpful to use motor neurons for connections which are already intended to move things and are already you know, sort of tuned to that behavior, it's perfectly possible with training to say use a chunk of nerves just like you know, some are convenient on the body and you know, do all the interaction through that area. Um, you know, like if you've got an implant site and you need a fairly um, you know, strong mechanical connection and you know, having a bunch of, fi of um, fine electrodes there might get in the way of that. One of the uh, other complicated issues around this is getting stuff through the skin. Um, because anytime you need to either put a structural anchor on or you know, break the skin with permanent electrical connections, you run into problems. Um, the data side of this, you may end up just using um, very near field RF, but there's also some interesting work being done on culturing gum tissue, which of course is really good at dealing with projections through the skin of hard, you know, less living objects and, you know, just so you, you know, take a bit from the gums, culture it up, implant that, use that to build the, uh, the edge of the uh, implantation site. So all of this research that's currently being done is aimed at traditional therapeutic implants. Um, a lot of this stuff is on the very, very cutting edge of work that's being done at, um, you know, for, for existing prosthetics. Most of these things are not things that you can simply go out and buy right now. Attitudes around prosthetics are a fascinating microcosm of how society treats disability and medicine in general. Research is almost always aimed at trying to bring the injured person kind of back to the social norm. However, once you've got basic integration with the human form, you can do all sorts of things. Amy Mullins is a double-leg uh, double amputee who's done a lot of groundbreaking work in artificial legs. Um, she built these unpowered carbon fiber blades, which were featured at the Paralympics and that kind of thing, which let her run at or possibly even above the peak efficiency of an, un of a, uh, an unamputated human, which is really kind of fascinating. Um, she gave a, a TED Talk a while back, which is, I, I highly recommend watching. She has a dozen different pairs of legs that she wears for different social situations, depending on what's going on, including a pair that makes her several inches taller. The first time she wore them to a party, a friend was shocked to see how tall she was. You know, she explained, like, what was going on. And her friend, her friend thought this was really unfair. I mean, prosthetics aren't some, supposed to make someone more able than normal, right? So this is a really simple example. Um, the prosthetics in question that she's using are static. They're not powered. Um, they're not wired into the nervous system, anything like that. 
the structural requirements for arms are pretty complicated, uh, or for legs are pretty complicated. You know, to be able to support a reasonable gait, especially if you're working with one existing leg and one modified leg, they have to mirror what's there pretty closely. But with arms, we can do pretty much whatever we want, um, you know, whatever feels useful. Um, another interesting area of emerging research is soft body robotics, basically things that move by similar mechanisms to slugs. Instead of having a rigid skeleton with joints that, um, you know, joints that are actuated, you have different soft volumes of tissue that are compressed by muscle-like things. They change shape and they change volume. One current Department of Defense research project involves building a surveillance robot that can move like an earthworm and can change its shape and its volume so it can squeeze under a thin gap in a doorway or go down a narrow pipe. Fabricating soft body robotics is pretty complicated. Um, there's a lot of promise in 3D printing technologies, especially as we get better multi-material printers so that you can print hard and soft things together in the same pass. If you combine all of these different technologies, we have a fairly realistic pr um, path to constructing a, func a uh, functional tentacle, either as a replacement limb or just an addition as an additional limb. Um, it won't be easy, it won't be fast, but there's no reason to believe that it's not both possible and not actually that far off into the future. So how are people gonna react the first time they see somebody walking down the street with a tentacle? How are they gonna react the first time they end up in bed with someone with a tentacle? If you lost an arm, what would you replace it with? <laughs> so, fuck buddies are great. Everybody should have at least a half dozen. <laughs> Scheduling really sucks. So, you decide you want to get laid tonight. You don't really have anybody specific in mind. Um, you send out an SMS to the emergency booty call system. <laughs> it propagates out. First, it hits your A list. Yeah, nobody bites. Then your B list, and then your C list. Um, <laughs> if nobody's taken up on you, the system asks you if you want to send out a broader sweep. Um, you've told the system you want to have dinner beforehand, so it looks at your preferences and anybody who responds preferences, picks out a location, um, looks at your calendars, figures out when you're both going to be off work, sets a time, if it needs to, it sends out a reservation request. Um, say everybody you know, you know, so yeah, so if everybody you know is busy, um, you know, when somebody who isn't on one of your lists gets a request, they're not just getting the, um, you know, they're not just getting a request from a random person. The people you sleep with have vouched for you. There's a whole social network reputation system. You know, we know how to build those. We've built them in a lot of other, con uh, lot of other um, contexts. So, um, you know, when somebody gets this request from you, they're getting, oh, this person is this far away from me socially. I trust this set of people who vouched for them, that kind of thing. Oops, let me skip it. So this concept and the next one are a little bit less design related than the rest, but they have implications which are really kind of too interesting to pass up. Given the biological complications of a pregnancy, it seems pretty unlikely that we're going to literally divorce reproduction from that kind of you know, physical context anytime soon. It's not actually going to be completely divorced from sex anytime in the near future. Um, that said, gene manipulation has already allowed us to create embryos with more than one genetic mother, more than one genetic father, et cetera. Um, this is obviously a good start towards having a non-traditional reproductive unit. Breastfeeding is a really fascinating and complex interaction with a new child. We're still figuring out all of the things that it does. Um, among other things, it appears to encourage an emotional bond that's a lot deeper than just the intimacy of that interaction. Um, there's also transmission of disease immunity via breast milk. Traditionally, of course, Breastfeeding only occurs with the birth mother, not with any other members of the family, um, maybe a wet nurse. Um, this is limiting even in traditional heteronormative families as the father is entirely excluded from that relationship with the child. Um, and it's also one of the chief criticisms which is labeled at non-traditional families that they don't have any kind of biological tie to the child. Medically though, there's really no reason for this. Inducing lactation is trivial in anyone. Um, why not use this ability to redesign 
the, a non-traditional family unit. Um, obviously, the criticisms which are, you know, aimed around, uh, you know, natural relationship with the child are a lot more politically motivated, but, you know, you can actually, you could actually redesign that relationship and strengthen that kind of natural connection. As it is, breastfeeding being limited to the mother is frequently pretty inconvenient. It's another site of this kind of heteronormative economic control around uh, motherhood. You know, if somebody wants to work outside of the house where they're breastfeeding, that makes life a lot more difficult. If all of the caregiving adults involved in raising a child can breastfeed, a lot of those restrictions suddenly go away. Of course, the existing construction of masculinity might be challenged a bit by this, but you know, is that really a bad thing? So gay marriage is fine and all, but is that even really what we want? Congratulations, the heteronormative relationship construct has been extended by one tiny notch. Why not fight to blow it out of the water instead? In the 1880s, or 1886 decision in uh, Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad, corporations were granted rights as natural persons with almost no legal precedent. Throughout their history, corporations have proved to be fascinatingly flexible legal entities. Why not use that same structural construct and design a modular set of contract law based around corporate law to enable whatever group of people want to decide on whatever set of legal relationship they'd like? Of course, designing a set of contracts and ensuring that they'll actually be enforceable is a completely different matter, but without an existing model that's been designed, you don't have anything to fight for. The economic structures of heteronormative relationships reinforce um, the relationships in the culture to a pretty impressive degree. If we want to break the pattern of relationships that enforce this heteronormativity, we have to break those economic relations as well that create them and support them and enforce them. Divorcing economic structures from reproduction is just as fundamental a social change as divorcing sex from reproduction is. This is an amazingly complex problem, of course, many parts of which have much, much more to do with social norms than anything related to design. But one thing that is specifically related is the way that heteronormative economic relations are literally programmed into and enforced by the built environment, the architecture around us, including the houses that we live in. So raising children is pretty hard. It's expensive, it takes a lot of labor, it's really hard to do it without some form of income and labor sharing. People do all the time, but it's a lot harder. The dominance of the intimate couple as the core of the family unit is reflected in housing and reproduces those sets of relations. If you want to construct some kind of alternate economic and labor sharing arrangement around raising kids, they literally don't fit into the houses that you can live in. Picture a group of three to five people, all either raising their own kids or committed to helping raise the um, children of the other people in the group. None of them are, inti are in intimate relationships with each other. Um, you know, they might be involved, but they're probably not. They may have partners, even serious long-term partners outside the group, but that's not the core group that's acting as a family structure. Where do they live? So one model could be a cluster of small apartments. Um, each has a bedroom for the parent and the child, um, you know, a separate bathroom, maybe a small private living space, and then they have a shared common kitchen and a shared living area. Um, try to shoehorn that relationship structure into a more traditional set of apartments might work, but it's gonna be a lot more difficult to create that kind of social structure without that sort of built environment, without that living space that mirrors that, that social structure. If a group like that can afford to go do their own custom construction work and that kind of thing, it's often difficult or impossible to actually build that kind of a house. Um, you have code requirements that say that you can't do that, and you have banks that just won't lend you money if they don't think they can resell the place if you default on your loan. If you don't have the money to do custom construction, forget it, you don't have any, you don't have any choice. You know, the best thing you can do is maybe find a set of one-bedroom apartments that are next door if you can find that many empty at the same time. So there are a lot of different varieties of housing types that we might want to investigate to mirror the kind of diversity of relationship patterns that we might want to have in society. 
until we get the variety available in the housing stock, those heteronormative relationship structures are going to maintain a huge amount of power because we literally won't fit into the world in any other way. So any questions? I've thrown a whole bunch of stuff out here. I, uh, I hope some of it will give you new ways to look at how we do what we do and how we construct relationships. So. Uh, Maybe. Have you seen it in a city where you can just go rent it? <laughs> I mean, yes, these things exist, and those kinds of things are great models to look at. Um, you know, this isn't something that doesn't exist at all, but it doesn't, it's not available to the kind of degree that it would need to make those sort of things, you know, make those sort of relationships fit into the world better. In the back. They almost certainly will. Um, I mean, the assumption that a lot of those things are made from is that you're already giving away all that information. You know, whether you intend to or not, it's already out there. It's already going to be used against you. Why not get some, edi some additional benefit out of it, too? Um, and I don't think that's a good thing, by the way. Th these are not, many of these are not hopeful fictions. These are not necessarily things I want to see come to pass. They're things that may come to pass anyway, though, and so we should think about them and decide what we want to do about that. Um, both, they used basically the same slide deck. I guess I forgot to, to change a couple of them. But yeah, no, I gave this previously at Ars Electronica, which is a fascinating conference on sex and technology held in the fall in San Francisco every year. I highly encourage anybody who found this talk interesting to go to it. Um, and so the slides, this is based, the, the content of the slide deck is basically the same um, for both talks. Um, the proceedings from that conference, I believe, yes, they will be available. Um, they're not published yet. They'll be published at next year's ARS. Um, they'll be coming out through Research Press, and the, the proceedings of the previous ARS Electronicas are available. Yep. I don't know if I don't know if we will ever get a. Uh, I would be very stunned if we ever got everyone in society agreeing about uh, the political ramifications of medical technology. Um, I think that the I think that there is an interesting difference between programming an implant to give the wrong answer and telling someone the wrong answer. That that layer of mediation introduces a question as to what the illegal act was. Was it having sex and exposing the person, or was it the programming of the implant? Because there's a lot more distance between the two, that, that, um, that dislocation introduces an interesting legal question. It's very similar, yes. It's very, it's very similar, but it may be, it, the, the intent is obviously the same, but the legal question isn't, and that's not a legal question we've ever had to ask. Uh, I, think, I think you were first. Uh, well, it was a comment on that uh, thing about reprogramming the, uh, the, the devices like that. Mm -hmm.
Right? Yeah. Now. Well, but the idea is that. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty complicated area. There's also a lot of issues where if you have an implanted medical device like that, your right to modify it can be very, very small. You may not actually have any right to reprogram that device. So the fact that you've reprogrammed it could be a separate crime on its own. Um, the, uh, the degree of right that we have over our body, medically speaking, is horrifyingly tiny. In the back? Okay. Oh, yeah. So it's not true. Sure. On the other hand, um, in a world where any time you make a, an electronic statement like that, it gets archived forever, think carefully before you use that as an excuse. Oh, almost, almost certainly. I mean, the, the guy who's doing the, the implantable orgasm stuff is currently pretty low on anybody's radar, and he's only working in women who are pre-orgasmic right now. He's not trying to expand that. And as soon as he tries to offer that to like the general public, yeah, it's going to be bad for him. Um, we're really, really, really bad about accepting that kind of medical augmentation as soon as it's letting you do something that normal people can't do, it's really heavily frowned on socially. That's how it'll happen if it's gonna happen. I mean, yeah, I, the, the open source medical world is going to do very interesting things to this kind of debate. You know, a lot of the, a lot of the implants that are doing, like the, the implants that are doing that orgasm control are a stock item. Um, and because they're a very special purpose item, they're not really medically restricted. Um, it might take a little bit of work to get your hands on an unimplanted device. And the surgery is kind of, kind of complicated, but uh, you know, you, it, is, it is not unreasonable that you could actually do it. So I think that's all the time we've got for questions. Um, remember, sleep with your local designer. The future of sex may depend on it. <laughs>